In ancient Rome, wars were fought with shields, swords, and javelins. In the American Revolutionary War, they upped the fighting power utilizing gunpowder and muskets and cannons, while in the two world wars, they took the combative technological advancements to new heights with innovations in automatic weaponry, flight, armored vehicles and tanks, and eventually, the unrivaled power of the atomic bomb. If you were to compare the methods of war from today to that of ancient societies, the old wars seem so primitively fought. So too may future generations look back on our current methods of war, perhaps with admiration of the groundwork that would lead to future advancements, or perhaps with disdain, focusing on horrors and atrocities that seem to linger in every corner of a combative zone. All of this I say to make the point that we don't know what the exact technology used to fight an interplanetary war will look like, but we can make some general assumptions about the tactics that could be used as well as using logic to determine what future humans would deem to be the best course of action in fighting between worlds. In this episode, continuing from the last, we will be comparing the conditions of the American Revolutionary War to determine if humanity is likely to split off between Earth and Mars in the same way the colonies did from the British. So prepare yourselves as we learn something new. War is expensive in terms of its economic impact, in terms of its military spending, and most importantly, in terms of human lives lost. We touched on the economic impact a little bit in the last episode, but in terms of military spending, according to a 2010 Congressional Research Service report on the cost of major US wars, the American Revolution cost the United States around $3.1 billion. But to give that number some context, let's just see how the colonies stack up. The best values I could find for how much the colonies were worth at the time come from a census of national wealth conducted in 1774, just two years before the US declared independence, which attempted to value all of the assets within the colonies. The number they concluded was around $600 million. Now, we can adjust that value for inflation, leaving us with around $20 billion in value for the colonies, but the United States today? It's worth around $225 trillion. Our military budget is by far the largest in the world, coming in at around $715 billion for 2022. If we had to spend the same percentage on a war as the colonies did, it would mean a war costing us nearly $35 trillion, more than an entire year's GDP. But the United States didn't fight the Revolutionary War alone. France helped significantly with the cost and the supply of military might. Yet, the newly formed American nation did struggle immensely from the financial devastation of the war, leading to the Depression of the 1780s, which some reports say was just as bad as the Great Depression due to the war's devastation of property, contractions in the labor force due to war deaths and injuries, and exclusion from British markets as well as a general lack of trust in the newly formed American economy from everyone but France, who was incidentally ramping up their own revolution. But now, let's get to the biggest point of contention, the actual fight itself. It may seem intuitive at first that a fight on a planet humans were not built to naturally live on would be fairly simple for an invading force. After all, the atmosphere alone is enough to kill them. It seems like it would be easy to launch a series of missiles, nuclear or otherwise, at the colony until enough holes were poked in important enough places that Mars' 95% carbon dioxide atmosphere could simply eradicate everyone. But this would likely be the last thing the colonizing force would want to do. Given the range of monetary support that we discussed in the last episode, being anywhere from the hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars required for the establishment of a self-sustaining colony, it would be much more likely that measures to retake the colony while minimizing damage and radiation would be preferred. So nukes are probably off the table. Not to mention the fact that it wouldn't just be soldiers getting their breath taken away. A self-sustaining colony would likely have multiple generations of families living there including the elderly and children, civilians. A massacre on this scale just wouldn't work well for the invading force, as other countries and even their own citizens look negatively on them for their actions. But here's where things fall apart. This is why a Martian invasion would not work. 
As you've probably already started to put together, one of the biggest problems with attacking a Martian colony is the time it takes to get there. When traveling between planets, you can't just go in a straight line, especially since Earth and Mars are constantly changing how much distance is between them. Earth obviously takes one year to orbit the Sun, but Mars takes about 1.9 years. Instead of being straightforward, a trip to Mars is a bit more roundabout, with the main path taken being the home and transfer orbit. It sends the rocket on a path to meet Mars where it will be at the time of arrival, with the full trip taking about 260 days, give or take 10 days. And as it currently stands, space shuttles have a max payload of about 65,000 pounds. While that number is increasing, with SpaceX claiming their newest rocket in development, the Falcon Heavy, will be able to carry about 117,000 pounds of cargo to orbit, as well as decreasing the cost of each pound of cargo to around $1,000, that's not very much for a war, especially since going to Mars means more fuel is required, meaning less space for people, food, gear, and weapons. There is a possible alternative to the home and transfer though, one called ballistic capture. Instead of shooting for where Mars will be in its orbit where the spacecraft will meet it, as typically done, a spacecraft instead gets shot into a Mars-like orbit so that it flies ahead of the planet. Although launch and cruise costs remain the same, there is no longer a big burn needed to slow down before reaching the planet. The spacecraft goes a bit slower than Mars, and eventually the planet catches up to the rocket, and gravitationally grabs it into its orbit. While the trip could feasibly lengthen the window that allows us to travel to Mars, it would take an already lengthy trip and make it take a few months longer. But even with steady improvements to payload capacity and travel speeds, unless there is a new groundbreaking technological development in space travel, there simply isn't a feasible way to retake a self-sustaining Martian colony without causing great damage with numerous lives lost. The ability for those on Mars to utilize their resources to make weapons and defenses, while those from Earth must ferry them, means the people of Mars have a near unbeatable home field advantage. Even the British had more success with this problem and still failed. At the height of the Revolutionary War, they were able to send ships full of troops and weapons across the Atlantic as fast as two weeks with favorable winds, and two and a half months with bad headwinds. Imagine how much harder it would be if it took two thirds of a year to get there, with a window of opportunity that only comes once every year and a half. So, if we do get to the point where we have a self-sustaining colony on Mars, let's just make sure we keep them happy. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. When I first came up with this episode idea, I knew that travel would be one of the biggest hurdles to tackle. I considered bringing in other countries wanting to fight proxy wars, talking about improvements to space travel technology, and going even deeper into what it would be like if other countries had their own bases simultaneously on Mars. Ultimately, those felt like they were straying too far from the original premise I'd laid out and getting speculative to the point of science fan fiction. But let me know what you think of the episode down in the comments below. This was a fun thought experiment for me to break up the pace of my normal episodes. If you want to see more like this, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. But in the meantime, Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.